Welcome back, guys, to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Today, I have the amazing Brad Sugars. Now, Brad Sugars started the Action Coach brand in 1993 in Brisbane, Australia. Today, the company is ranked as the leading business coaching franchise by Entrepreneur Magazine. Action Coach operates in over 80 countries and has more than a thousand coaches around the world, coaching 15,000 businesses every week. The franchise has received numerous awards, including fastest growing franchise, franchisee satisfaction, best overall company, and has named has been named the number one business coaching franchise in the world every year since 2004, which is freaking amazing. Uh, using the coaching strategies that have helped thousands of companies around the world, Brad Sugars has, and his executive team helped lead Action Coach and its coaches to some of its most profitable and best years ever. In the face of challenging economic conditions, Brad Sugar and his team continue to build business re-education to new, more innovative and exciting levels. I am so thrilled to have Brad on the show today, all the way from the US. Welcome, Brad Sugars. Hey, I should have you write my intro everywhere. That was kind of cool. <laughs> I feel like I should have a drum roll here. I'm um, really, really excited to have you on the show and congratulations for your amazing success. Uh, and I know that I'm going to learn a lot from you just having you on the show. So thank you for, for giving me your time and the viewers your time. Yeah, most welcome. You know, I think that, um, you know, as an Aussie who came to America almost 20 years ago to build business, it was like one of those great things. And it's great to see so many more Aussies doing it today. And uh, yeah, it's been a good time. Yeah, brilliant. Um, th the first question I want to ask you, and, and sometimes people say, entrepreneurs are amazed. They're, they're just born that way. And, <laughs> and looking at your book, I know for a fact that when you were seven years old, you were selling your Christmas presents to your brothers. And yes, not only dad. that, you took it to the next level, which I just thought was a crack up. You took it to the next level by renting out your toys mm -hmm. so that you got the money and then you got the toys back. <laughs> My dad does love telling that story to embarrass the heck out of me. But uh, yes, so, uh, you know, I think that... Um, you're you're definitely everyone has a level of entrepreneurial flair within them they have a level of this level of entrepreneur the question is does that get um uh built does that get added to or do you deny it do you all you know i remember my dad talking to my brothers and i one time and i was in business with myself and we were at a family dinner and and uh, my other brothers thought I was crazy for being in business for myself. And dad took them and said, you know what? I would have been in business for myself much earlier if it wasn't for the fact that I got a mortgage and got all these costs. And I, I thought, you know, it's too risky to go out and do that sort of stuff. And, but in the end, what I've worked out is it's far riskier to have a job where you have one boss than it is to have a business where you have thousands of clients. You know, you lose one client, you've still got a business. You lose one boss, you've got no money at all. So... But yeah. I was never good. I was never good at having a job. I don't think I could have ever kept a job. I'm not a good employee. Much better employer than employee. What, why do you think that is? Uh, I'm very blunt. I'm very straight to the point. And if something's silly, I tell the person that. So not good at, uh, at, at having the bosses around with that sort of thing. But ultimately, I think that, you know, be, an entrepreneur can be built. You know, yeah. an entrepreneur can be built. We can learn the skills of entrepreneur. If you, if you list, if you sit down and you say, okay, these are the 20 things you need to learn to be a good entrepreneur. Any of us can learn those things. I was lucky enough. You, know, you mentioned uh, I grew up in Brisbane, Brisbane city town hall. I was 16 years old. I met Jim Rohn, E James Rohn. And you know, he taught me a very simple thing. Read a book a week for the rest of your life. If you want to be successful. Yeah. So, you know, I had to learn leadership. I read dozens and dozens of books on leadership. I had to learn management. I had to learn sales, I had to learn marketing. So I'm an avid reader and learner. And, um, you know, I, Audible is probably one of the most played apps on my phone. If you look at screen time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How did, how did you fall into then the coaching industry? 
Well, see, you got to remember, coaching didn't exist when I started. Yeah. It was consulting. And so when, when I first started this whole thing of business coaching, um, it was because I had other businesses as well at the same time. And people were like, because I was giving speeches, uh, a gentleman who uh, wrote a very good book called uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, asked me to speak when I was very young. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll come along and speak. And I fell in love with speaking. I really enjoyed teaching and, and the, the, the ability to impact people in that way. And uh, so people would always come up to me at the end of things and say, well, can you consult with us? Can you help us? And I said, listen, I can't consult with you. I'm busy running my own thing. I'm doing these speech things on the side. Uh, but listen, if you call me every week, I can maybe coach you through a few ideas on how to do things. And after... You know, you know, you get that brainwave after the like 50th person asks you, can I pay you for this? You kind of sit down and go, maybe I should start a business doing that one, right? <laughs> yeah. And so that was 20, 1993. So yeah, 27 years ago this August. So next, uh, next month, it'll be 27 years that we've been helping business owners across the planet. And, wow. Um, yeah, I gave it the name coaching because it was just... I remember reading Trout and Reese, uh, the, the 22 immutable laws of marketing. And one of the immutable laws was if you can't be number one or number two in a category, invent a new category. And so that's basically what I did with coaching. I said, you know, I, I, there's no way I can be the number one or number two in consulting. So I'll, I'll just be a business coach, not a business consultant. And for the first probably five years, people were like, what's that? What, yeah. what do you mean a coach? And then eventually they would, I started to compare it to sport and said, coaching is not just for sport. And so we use that for branding all around the world. And nowadays people understand what business coaching is. Now they just need to decide to have one or not have one. So we're in that phase of, you know, when I first started, people didn't know what coaching was. And then we went into a phase of, oh, if you're failing, you need a coach. Right. You know, that's, that's what you do. And yeah. now we've sort of reached the phase of, oh, you're doing good. Oh, to do great, you should go and get a coach. And yeah. I think that we're very lucky. I was chatting with uh, Marshall Goldsmith. He's the top executive coach in the world. And I was chatting with him about this whole subject. And, and we've both seen in the last four to five years a real shift to winners having coaches more than those who are struggling having coaches. So that's, that's been a really great shift for the whole profession, I think. Beautiful, beautiful. And with your coaching franchise, how are you guys different than other coaching businesses out there? Well, I mean, when you, when you sit down and you look at it, first of all, uh, we invented the business. So it's like, yeah. that's, you know, we are the number one for a reason. We have a systematic methodology to show people how to grow businesses. You know, yeah. if you want to, if you are a business owner and you want to learn to grow a business, there is a recipe. There is a, when I'd written, I wrote my book, The Business Coach, after I had coached, or we as a team had coached 13,000 business owners already to success. Yeah. And so we then sat down and wrote a book on, here is the actual methodology, the systematic methodology you should follow if you want to be a success in a, as a business owner. And the crazy thing is people all go out there and they study for years to be a great hairdresser and then never spend a day studying how to be a great business owner. Yeah. You know, and so that to me is the thing. I think ultimately though, the collective knowledge of my team is what sets us apart from everybody. You know, I've got team members who've been with me since day one. So I've got uh, literally hundreds of coaches who've been with me 10, 15, 20 years doing this thing. So our collective knowledge on how to get a business to solve any problem is, is just massive, yeah. just massive. Wonderful. What's been your biggest... I think our, gar our guarantee is probably, I think we're the only business coaching firm in the world that offers an actual guarantee of if we don't make you more money than you pay us, we'll work for you for free. Yeah. So it's really measured in mm. regards to, because sometimes I think coaching can be very um, not tangible. So your yeah. results are, are measured. Well, the fun thing about business is it is very, very tangible. They'll yeah. tell you very quickly if they're making more money from what you're doing or not. Yeah, um, and that's that's always going to be the case. But I look at it from a point of view that coaching, if, if you had a sporting coach and you didn't win more games because of your coach, the coach should disappear. The same is true yeah. for business. If you don't start making more profitability and working less hours, then yes, you should get a different business coach. So. Yeah, absolutely. With what's been your biggest challenge in growing such a massive business 
What's been one of your biggest challenges? Human resources. Human yeah. resources is always a challenge, especially because we're in 80 odd countries. You know, you've, when you're managing, like, you know, our, our business in Russia, you know, I don't speak Russian. Uh, I don't really understand the Russian culture, but I have to work with my, my business partners and my uh, team in Russia to be able to develop our business in Russia. And so developing your people, if you want to grow a business, you've got to grow the people. There's no two ways about it. So you've got to hire good and build great. That's always been uh, the philosophy. Well, not always. Actually, when I was 20 or 21, I remember going to my dad and said, Dad, I just can't get good people. And he looked me dead in the eye and said, son, you get the people you deserve. Yeah. You're an average, average <laughs> manager that. running an average business. So the highest caliber of employee you're going to get is average. And it was like, oh, thanks, Dad. Appreciate you. you know. <laughs> Very wise words there, I think. <laughs> oh, extraordinarily wise. He could have been a little less blunt, though. Maybe a little less blunt. <laughs> uh, what, what's been your biggest learnings as your business has grown? And, and I know it sounds like you can keep continuing to learn. As yeah, look, that, that's a tough one because the biggest learnings are, are always that there is no one biggest learning, I guess, you know, that, that, that you're consistent. I think probably from a philosophy point of view, the biggest learning is you should go faster than you think you can. Um, you know, everyone is way too slow in business. They doubt themselves and they go into that self doubt and that worry of, Oh, what if it doesn't, what if it doesn't, what if it doesn't, and you should just go faster. You know, that that's the thing from a business point of view, um, I would have to go back to the people one that if I build my people, they build my business. You know, if I try and do it all myself, then it, it isn't a business. It's a job and I work for an idiot. Um, yeah. That's, that's the simplest reality of it. So you've got to build a business that, that, that can do it, whether you show up or not. Yeah. How have you navigated through the COVID situation with your business? Um, well, I have nine businesses, so uh, all all nine of them, uh, sorry, all bar one of them, we kept running. We have a restaurant here in Vegas where I live at the Wynn Casino, and of course, when casinos were fully shut down, we had no choice but to uh, fully shut down the, the, the restaurant. So, But all of uh, our other businesses, we pivoted or found a way to go virtual or we changed our products, changed our services, like our, our food truck business, that was decimated. It, you know, spring for us is when we, because our food trucks are at festivals and concerts and all of those sorts of things. And spring yeah. is 50% of our annual revenue. So yeah. we lost 50% of our annual revenue right there. So we had to change the business entirely to get it through. Um, the biggest thing for me, I guess, is that I, I'm, I don't know if you can say lucky. I'm lucky enough that this is the fourth uh, economic downturn I've run my businesses through. Yeah. So, you know, over the years, I've had uh, multiple different companies in multiple industries. And first economic downturn, I didn't know what I was doing. And I did that whole head in the sand and hope like heck it'll change type thing. And that didn't serve me well at all. Didn't serve anyone well. The second time around, I knew I had to act, but I didn't really have the confidence to act because, you know, in an economic downturn, you've got to, first of all, uh, have a plan for survival, then a plan for thriving, and then a plan for taking advantage of all of the opportunities that come because of the economic downturn. Um, and so the second time, I, I, I sorry, the third time, uh, I really took action. The third time, actually, in 2008, I literally spent a million dollars of my own money to fly all around the world and teach people how to survive this thing and how to thrive through it. So yeah. this, this time around, because of the virtual viral nature of it, it was really interesting. I was forced to go, like I am here with you, and go virtual. And uh, we've helped more than half a million business owners just through my uh, teachings and podcasts and stuff like that around the world since COVID started. So we, we are in a very simple mind. Whenever there's a negative, you double down, you go harder, you go faster, you do more, you don't do less. You, and I, I literally, and, and maybe, you know, we can find the link to it. Uh, my team can get it for you. I literally recorded a 10 day program for people on how to survive and thrive during COVID. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, right. and lately, lately it's been a lot of two steps forward, one step back, and uh, especially you know, like Melbourne. Melbourne right now is two steps back almost. It's like three steps forward, two steps back, and you start seeing that. And so, it's really about uh, right now. It's really about the mental focus that we can give people, and if we can 
help people stay mentally strong during this? Because listen, we, we, we're no way out of the woods on this one yet. And it's going to get better and worse and better and worse. And it's just going to keep doing that. So um, different markets are going to be behaving differently. But ultimately for me, it was work much harder and do much more and take really good care of your people and survive by keeping all of your best customers with you. Um, and just do all of the things that needed to be done. You know, I know our commercial cleaning business down in Australia, you know, we had to, we had to knuckle down because, you know, a lot of the gyms that we have as clients, but we ended up coming out of this thing much bigger and much stronger because all of the commercial cleaning that we're doing right now for, you know, basically COVID style cleaning the, to that degree is quite phenomenal. And so we won a lot of business by doing that. And, you know, we kept a lot of our good customers, our gym customers, who we said, we're just going to keep cleaning whether you can pay us or not. And because uh, you're shut, we'll only do it once a week instead of, uh, you know, every day. But when you can pay us, pay us. If you can only pay us half, pay us half. But whatever, we'll stay with you. And because of that, we won a lot of businesses on, on referral and that sort of thing. So, you know, it, COVID is not going to beat our businesses. That's for certain. We're going to beat this thing from a business perspective. but yeah um, you know we just got to make sure we all stay healthy to make sure we can beat it from a business perspective absolutely that's, and, and that's one of the hardest parts remembering that it is a human crisis first and an economic yeah. crisis second yeah it's really interesting watching the the, the patterns of people's behaviors so mm. you know, some businesses business owners are shrinking and you're not seeing them doing anything um mm. and i have to say it's, it's really great to hear your journey of experience going through different crises because this is probably the first one I've gone through. And the first thing I said was fuck. <laughs> 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 and because I'm such a face to face person and I love that interaction. It was like, shit. It took me a couple of days to say, JJ, you've got to start freaking doing something and yeah. uh, get your head out of the sand and step up. Uh, mm. And so I think it's great also seeing the business owners step up, try something new. It's, I find it really inspiring seeing people doing different things. Yeah. Well, you've got to remember, if we go back to the last economic crisis, 2008, and we start to imagine what businesses were created during that time frame, we get things like WhatsApp, Instagram, we get things, you know, all of these amazing businesses that were created because of crisis. Right? Crisis leads to opportunity. The level of opportunity right now in the market, I'm negotiating on two businesses to buy right at this point in time because I sit down and I look at it and I just go, the level of opportunity is going to be crazy in the next little while. I, just, I literally got an email from a buddy or a text from a buddy of mine today. He, he was at a thing the other week. He's renovating properties right now and he was at a thing and they were selling off all of this amazing cookware stuff like Wolf Kitchen, Sub-Zero stuff. Yeah. And they were selling it all off and he just said to them, well, how much for all of that? And they said, well, I don't know. And they came up with a price. He said, done, I'll buy all of that. And he just unloaded it all for double just uh, yesterday. So it's like wow. the, the level of opportunity right now is massive. It's just massive yeah. and, and, and you're either looking for opportunity right now or you're going to be one of the opportunities. It's your yeah. choice. How have, what have you been doing in ISO? Because you guys are still in full, are you full in full lockdown? Uh, no, we went to phase two. We've gone back to phase one and a half, but uh, I took, so I, I spent the first, so from end of February, I started teaching for this thing because we, we could see the writing on the wall end of February when Italy and China were where they were at. We started teaching how to survive and thrive through this thing. Um, and so I spent basically till the end of last month just glued to this screen and teaching. Um, and then I took the family away for two and a half weeks. We hired two big motorhomes and traveled around the country and just got every now. You, you got to remember, I got five kids, homeschooling five kids. Yeah. My wife is an absolute saint. That There is no <laughs> two ways about that, you know. The teachers lied. My kids are not a pleasure to have in classes. <laughs> um, you know, so, so yeah, we, we went through it all the same as everyone else. You know, I'm pretty lucky. We have a pretty big place to live in. So, yeah. And, and the weather turns nice so we could be in the pool and all that sort of stuff. But dang, it's, it's, uh, we did, we went as stir crazy as the next person. I gotta tell you, there was some stir crazy times out there. 
Do you take up any hobbies like singing or playing the piano or no, the only friends? the only hobby I took up was uh, getting on Zoom every day and teaching business owners. You know, yeah. look, I, I it's it's very hard for a lot of business owners, especially like yourself, first time going through an economic downturn. Yeah. You know, when business owners their first time going through an economic downturn, they hit panic immediately. It's just yeah. there, there's nothing else for them to hit. You know, I, I, I relate it back to, uh, you know, the farm. I'm lucky enough that our family had farming in our background. And so when you look at uh, summer, winter, spring, fall, you know, you understand. And, and I, back in the start of 2019, I was with a group of my friends and we all sat around and said, what's going to cause the downturn? Because it had to come. Yeah. Twenty, we were in. We were twenty twelve to twenty twenty. We were in the biggest economic boom that uh, we'd seen as a globe, as a planet. Right? Yeah. There had to be a downturn. We thought it was going to be Brexit, or we thought uh, Korea, or maybe the U.S. elections later this year. None of us could have guessed it was some crazy guy in China that was going to cause this pandemic that took lives and. Uh, ruined businesses and now we see the the social impact of all of this in the suicide levels and mm. just the, the the riots and protesting that followed because everyone was stir crazy you know yeah. and, and yes they were I, it's like okay so we, we write it over uh, black lives matter i don't think it would have mattered what it was people were looking for some reason to go stir crazy at this at, at, at the end of this lockdown if we look back at previous lockdowns in history we see uh, that stuff happening a lot. So, yeah, but, absolutely. As a business owner going through all of this, what, what do you, regardless of COVID, what do you think makes up the makeup of a great business owner to be successful? What sort of personality traits do you think that they need or have mm. to acquire? Yeah. So skill wise, skill wise, it's got to be communication, got to be management and leadership. And, and, and I think they're the most important skills. People sort of say, Oh, but do they need to know marketing? Do they need to know sales? Do they need to be, you need to know enough about that to employ great marketing people. You need to know enough about that to employ great sales people. You don't have to be brilliant at that thing, but you have to be brilliant at management. You have to be brilliant at leadership and you have to be brilliant at communication. Yeah. Um, from a personality viewpoint, I think, I, I think self, self-determination is probably the biggest, uh, thing. The most, most small business owners that I see fail, they don't fail because they're bad at the job of the business. They fail because they never succeeded at becoming a business owner. Like you've got my book billionaire in training, right? Where we talk about the difference between self-employed and manager and owner. Yeah. That self-employed person, most of them never get out of the employee mindset. So they still think like an employee, even though they now own their own business and they don't, they own a job. They work for a crazy person. They're, they're aiming to build a business because yeah. business by definition, if, if my definition of a business is a commercial profitable enterprise that works without you. If you have to be there, it's not a business, it's a job. You know, yeah. and that's, that's what you have to realize. And that's where a lot of people struggle with that because they're thinking, well, what is it that I need to create? How am I going to, to do that? And that's what the planning side of all of this thing in business is all about. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things I find really interesting, and I know that this has been a challenge of mine, particularly when I first started out in coaching, was people's relationship with money. Hmm. how would you define your relationship with money? And I'll give you another question. And then how do you define or how do you see a lot of people's relationship with money? Okay. So let's start with what I perceive money to be. Money is an idea backed by confidence that's exchangeable. Yeah. So for, for there to be money, like if you want me to invest money in your business, you've got to give me the confidence that you're going to, uh, that your idea will be successful and that uh, you'll be able to exchange or give me my money back or give me a return on my investment at some point in time. Type. Yeah. Most people's relationship to money is based on what they grew up and how they grew up with it. I was lucky enough, uh, very young to study a gentleman by the name of uh, Reverend Ike, Dr. Frederick Ike Karen Cotter. And Reverend Ike was a teacher and a preacher on the subject of money. And uh, he grew up in Harlem and uh, he ended up owning a city block in Harlem for his church. 
And uh, I was lucky when I was, dang, I bought him out of retirement. He was 80 odd. And I bought him out of retirement to come and teach me and all of my coaches one time. And Reverend Ike, he preached on the subject of money because the subject of money, most people believe those silly things like money is the root of all evil. And, you know, you keep the good linens for when the guests come over and that sort of thing. And you, and they have a negative relationship to money. They see money as that, but my relationship to money is money is just a multiplier. Yeah. Money and fame and money are both multipliers. If you're a really nice person and you get a lot of money, you'll be an amazingly nice person. Yeah. If you're a complete jerk and you get a lot of money, you will be a massive jerk. Yeah. You know, there's that, that's basically the way money seems to, to, uh, be bring out in people who they really are type thing. Yeah. Um, you know, listen, I'll, I'll be blunt. One of the reasons I moved to America is because Americans relationship to money is very different to Australians relationship to money. I remember being in Australia and I love cars. And I remember one day driving down the street in Brisbane and, and uh, I, I had a beautiful yellow Lamborghini Gallardo. And uh, I remember just pulling up a set of lights and a guy walking across the street, looked at me, looked at the car, looked at me, looked at the car. And, you wanker. And it was like, yeah. Huh. Now, of course that would only happen in Brisbane. It wouldn't happen in Sydney or Melbourne or anywhere like that, uh, you know, but I remember here in the States, I'd lived here, Oh, a few years and um i had a beautiful i have a beautiful rolls royce i still have it today it's a blue convertible uh, rolls and i remember pulling up at a set of lights a couple of young guys pulled up next to me in a in a honda and they put the window down they lent out the car and they were like hey buddy great car well done yeah yeah you know, wow. now, so so attitudinally you know, Australia still does have very much a convict mentality when it comes to money. I mean, it just yeah. does. I don't, I don't. Poppy syndrome. Uh, the tall poppy syndrome, it just guts me in Australia. I remember going yeah. back to speak at the Australian small business, uh, small business week and speaking before me was, uh, was prime minister Howard and speaking just after me was Kevin Rudd when he was running against prime minister Howard. Yeah. And, uh, I was in the middle, so I had to try and be apolitical. Um, which is very difficult for me to not offer an opinion. Um, but interestingly enough, I, I brought up the subject of how Australian entrepreneurs are some of the best entrepreneurs in the world. And the reasoning for that is actually relatively simple. Australia is one of the hardest markets to succeed in the world. It's one of the hardest. You've got a, a, a very small population base, massive costs of distribution because it's such a vast country and everything's got to come from overseas in, in most cases massive wage costs. The wage costs in Australia are beyond ridiculous. When I explain to people outside of Australia, the 17 and a half percent leave loading for people when they're on vacation, they look at me like I'm a complete moron, you know, <laughs> and it's like, no, no one does that. Yep. And four weeks paid vacation. But when do they get four weeks? See here in the US, the first week you work for a company, you get one week. Uh, that year, the second year you'll graduate to two weeks, and then the third, if you're lucky, you'll graduate to three weeks, and that's about it. That's sort of the end of it. And there's not this thirteen thousand public holidays and all that sort of stuff. So, for you to succeed in Australia, you've got to be amazingly good, amazingly good. And that's why I love teaching Aussie entrepreneurs to go overseas because, yeah, look, here here in the United States, I, I love. This is my adopted country. I'm married in American. I live here. I'm half American, half Australian. I, I, I carry both passports. Um, still have a home in Australia, though. My home on Hamilton Island is still there. So we love getting down to Hamo and, and doing that. And hopefully we'll be able to, hopefully we'll be allowed back one day. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. But, but I sit down and I look at how well uh, Aussie entrepreneurs do when they go overseas. And I, I just think that more and more of them should. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. With um, you being a mentor to so many people, what mentors have you had? And I mentioned a couple mentors in your life that you really feel has helped you on your journey. Yeah, look, um, my dad was obviously a very good early mentor, especially in common sense. My dad was very much street smart. That was sort of the thing that he taught me. My mum was very book smart. So I was kind of lucky to have both role models and both mentors early on um in that um jim Rohn was one of the first early people that i learned from a whole bunch uh you know he i was lucky at age 16 i won the rotary youth leadership award 
uh, in my area, in Sunnybank, uh, in Brisbane, Queensland. And they sent me away for a one week training on how to be successful and how to be a leader at 16. Wow. That, that, that changed the trajectory of my life. And that's why if you can invest in someone who's 16, 17, 15, if you can invest in leadership training for them, that to me is one of the, the, the biggest things you can do for people. Hence our foundation, the Action Coach Foundation, we spend a lot of time educating young people how to be employers, not employees. Yeah. Um, and, and that to me is, is of importance. Um, I've totally lost track of what the question was now because I... <laughs> um, mentors, that's right. Mentors. Look, I'm lucky enough that with my business being a business coaching company, I literally have thousands of people who are just phenomenal business people who are around me all the time. And uh, luckily, all of our franchise partners are willing to tell me exactly how I should run the business. So uh, although I don't really run the business anymore, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a really great team that run the business and I get to be the face of the company and uh, relax and not shave and wear t-shirts and ball caps and stuff. So, <laughs> Love know, it. So. Love it. As a, as a leader, what values do you have as a leader for yourself? Oh, dang. Um, let's first of all, give you my definition of leadership. So management is about competent, productive people. That's what management is building competent, productive people upon, uh, once you've got good management, then you can build good leadership. Leadership is about passionate, focused people. So, you know, my role as a leader is to keep people focused. My role as a leader is to give them something to focus on that's positive, to keep them focused on what's working, to keep them focused where their energy needs to be, not, not on the negatives. You know, you saw it with COVID. I watched a lot of companies where the leaders just shut down. They didn't say anything to their people and their people were lost. And, you know, now the business is lost. It's, it's crazy. And then the other is the passion. You know, I, I, when I sat down and, started action coach i wrote our vision of world abundance through business re-education you know to change the world by re-educating business owners and save the world one business owner at a time and create we create more jobs than most governments uh, by what we do because literally every business we coach that adds jobs it's phenomenal phenomenal part of the success of any economy but um, I, I think ultimately a leader has to come with a servant mentality and if they do that then then you know, everything works well. Um, you know, I, 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 I guess ultimately the leader's job, if you go back to one, it's, it's an old saying, but it's very true. And that is the leader's job is to create more leaders. Um, yeah. my, my job is to consistently create people who can lead, you know, keep building them. All of my executive teams and all my companies, my job is to coach them to be better at their job. My job is to consistently make sure they're better so that they can build a better business. Because if I don't build my people, they won't build the business. Yeah, absolutely. What, one of the things I'm really passionate about as a, a, a public speaking coach is women stepping up even more and getting on mm -hmm. the speaker circuit. And you talk, mm -hmm. talked about how you love speaking uh, before. Why do you think that, or what do you, what's your view on women in leadership in comparison to men in leadership and why we haven't got more le women in leadership and, and women on the speaker circuit? What would be your thoughts on that? Dang, don't throw me any easy ones, will you? Um, <laughs> you know, look, I, I, we, we hire a lot of speakers in my company and we really struggle to get uh, female speakers. We do. Yeah. You know, um, and I, and as an opinion as to why, Oh, I don't, I, I honestly have not sat and contemplated why more women don't go into speaking. I know for us as a business coaching company, and I, I, I've thought about it from business coaching, so I'll, I'll do it from that angle. Yeah. Uh, several, in our top hundred coaches, uh, we would have at least half of them a female. Yeah. In an organization where only one third of our organization is female. So we, we, we literally specifically run targeted ads to find more women. They are amazingly great coaches, yeah. amazingly great coaches. And I think a big part of that is ego. Men let ego get in the way of, of their success. Whereas, um, you know, and not all women, cause this, this is the thing you can't generalize women because like, I have four daughters. So I, I'm an advocate for strong women from yeah. the day I was done. You know, the first book I read when I knew I was having a daughter is called strong father, strong daughter by Meg Whitman. And it was the first 
book on raising kids that I read. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I sit down, I look at it. I ultimately, um, things take time, you know, and young people aren't on the speaking circuit either. Yet I started when I was 20 out on the speaking circuit. Yeah. You know, so I think that, I don't know, I've built a ton of female phenomenal speakers. I've built a ton of them in my organization and they're some of the best of the best. And I love watching them get up there because they're, they're empathetic, but they'll tear you to pieces if you need a lesson. <laughs> oh my God. You know, um, I would love to see more female speakers out there in the circuit. One of my good friends, Sharon Lecter, she co-wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki. And Sharon is probably one of the most powerful female speakers. And, and I've used Sharon a bunch. And actually, I was just talking with Mari Smith, who's the queen of Facebook. I've used her a bunch. And she's speaking for me again at another event in a few weeks' time. And, and I find their ability to move audiences is phenomenal. Um, you know, Susie Lightfoot, a good friend of mine in Australia, she came to me the other month asking, where can I learn to be a speaker? And now she's crushing it out there. I, I, look, I think that it's not just women who are scared of speaking, it's everybody. But I think it's possibly, and this is why I try and teach my daughters, is that you have a voice, use it. Yeah. You know, having four daughters, my eldest being 18 and my youngest being two, you know, I, I really having to help them understand the power of their female voice and to use their voice and to not feel like they're, they're hidden and that sort of thing. You know, it, it's interesting because here in America, and, and it's, it's wrong that people see America as a racist country. America is not a racist country in any way, shape or form. You know, it's, there are racist people, but it's not a racist country. But I, I ask the question to people, who got the vote in America first, women or black men? Men, black men got the vote well before women did in America. America is more sexist than it is racist. And that's just not America. That's the world. I mean, for goodness sake, but I uh, look, dang, I would be a lot richer if I, uh, than I am if I could solve that one for you. Greater, <laughs> philosophers, greater philosophers than you and me have debated that for a lot longer than you and me have. But <laughs> I, I love, I have so many powerful female business friends that I just love watching them get out there and do that stuff. And you know, women are some of the best supporters of women, but I gotta tell you, you girls also beat the heck out of each other harder than any men do. Like you girls rip each other. And it's scary because like I, my, my second eldest daughter, I had to have a whole conversation with her recently because I don't know, like, guys just don't tear each other the way girls do. And, it, and, it's, and it's like, it's hard for me to understand that. And she had to educate me around that stuff. And listen, I think that, uh, and this is the very thought logical side of me. I, I think that uh, more women should be out there than I. Um, more women should want leadership positions than do. Um, but it's going to take time. It's a generational shift. You know, it, it just is. I, I, I don't see, I don't see any of my daughters stepping back in any way, shape or form and not taking a leadership position. If there's a leadership position offered, they're stepping up. I, well, I hope they are. My wife, damn, she's a strong woman. So, <laughs> well, it's, it's really interesting, the patterns of, and this is a big generalization, but with the men that come into my courses and the females that come into my courses, it's the simple things that I've observed with women in comparison to, to men. And this is a big generalization, hmm. but men, when even they say their title, they'll say, they'll say it with strength. It's like, I'm a CEO or I'm an owner of a business and hmm. they will step in and they'll go for things. Whereas women even say their name quietly. They'll even, they'll downplay who they are yeah. rather than, taking you know putting their hand up saying i'm in and i'm ready to go for it uh they're holding themselves back so you know what's going to happen from this conversation a lot more massively strong women are going to come and see you you know <laughs> you're going to get a lot more massively strong women because the, the thing is that you you've got to start attracting that you've got to attract those strong women into your life i i watch the women in my franchise here and and i'm just thinking of a few of them right now and dang 
I, I, but I, I also watch who they were when they first joined me and who we've helped them become as people. And that's right. one of the greatest joys for me in business is watching people grow and watching people become who they really choose to be and stepping into their light and stepping into their power. And that's what we do for business owners. You know, I, my course, my 30X business course, my 30X life course, it's called 30X is 30 minutes a day for 30 days. And I sell for 99 bucks because it's not about making a ton of money, that thing for me. It's about making sure I reach as many people as I can. But I watch people over the time of going through that course and I watch the impact we have on people. And I, I think that's probably one of the greatest joys there is to, to doing what you do and what I do is, is getting to see that. But dang, I, I know some of the female coaches in my team now and they are the, just the strongest of strong women. I get... And I'm lucky I've had female CEOs running my companies for about half of my life. So half the time I had female CEOs and half the time I had male CEOs. And dang, if they weren't some strong women that put me on my backside sometimes. <laughs> Love that. And it's just so beautiful watching, watching people step into their power. I, that's mm. why I do what I do. I love seeing people do that. So uh, the, the other thing I wanted to know is with being a coach and a leader and a, a business owner of so many businesses, self care must be really important for you in regards to your mindset and your physical mm -hmm. uh, body. What habits do you have to ensure that you've got a really strong mind and that you're keeping your body healthy? What are your, what are your habits or your rituals that you have? Yeah. So uh, again, uh, glad you changed the word there to ritual. So I was about to exactly say exactly <laughs> that. Um, you know, for me, exercise every day is ritualistic. Uh, you know, I get up in the morning, I have several things on the balcony in my house. I'm overlooking all of Las Vegas, but I just walk straight out there in the morning and go exercise before everyone in the house gets up. Um, that that's ritualistic eating healthy, eating well. You know, I, I still remember as a young man having to learn to eat real well because you're, you're, energy levels during the day just got sucked out of you if you didn't you know and you couldn't perform at your peak um so yeah staying extraordinarily fit and healthy is is a big part of it but i've had periods like i when my wife was pregnant with our last baby um actually both of us we we were uh, unfortunately both caught in uh, route 91 and uh harvest and and uh you know from that the post-traumatic stress led us both to not a good place and i I remember it was uh, New Year's Eve, so about three, four months later, New Year's Eve, my wife was pregnant and I looked pregnant um, and, and uh, just standing there and, uh, and just saying, okay, fatso, time to get back to being fit again. You know, there's times in your life where you'll fall off the treadmill, but yeah, you just gotta, you just gotta get back on and, and do what you can do to stay fit and stay healthy. I think it's, it's a very important. If you want your mind to perform at peak levels, you've got to take care of your body. You, the health of your gut determines your happiness levels because it's, there's so many things like that that people have to make sure. But as a business owner, you need to be healthy. You need you need to be healthy. Yeah, and you mentioned that you were reading one book a week. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Book a week. That's what yeah. Jim Rohn taught me when I was sixteen. So yeah, book and a week for the rest of your life. life. One of, Most one of the of, time I did more than a book a week though. Most of the time when I was young, I, I had plenty of time so I could just read yeah. as much as, as much as possible. These days, you know, I'm lucky. I, I love audible. So uh, I get a lot yeah. of books read to me every week. So yeah, makes sense. same, same. And with your, because with everything that's going on in the world, one of the things that I make sure that I do is I really limit what that noise of say the news, like I'll get what I need to get. And then I just filter everything else out and mm. make sure that I'm filling my mind with all the stuff that's going to serve me like audio books, like reading books, yeah. all those sorts of things. During, during COVID was the first time I've watched the news in 20 years. Yeah. So I have not watched the news in 20 years. I don't, I just don't find a need for it anymore. It's like, it's no longer news. It's now opinions. It should just be called opinions. Yeah. Um, because it's it's not the news. It's it's this is my opinion about what happened. Yeah, you're supposed to tell me what happened, and I'm supposed to make up my opinion on what happened. I'm not supposed to, you know, have my opinion told to me by you. But 
it seems to be the way the world is these days. So yeah, yeah. We'll see. Now I I mentioned your book before, and I have <laughs> your book that I've had for I don't even know how many years I've had this for. You know that cover that cover was uh, when I self published that book, so that would have been seventeen. Uh, what are we? Twenty 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 three. So you say how old I am. <laughs> 15, probably 15 years ago. That was the third book I ever wrote. So this is the latest one. This is book number 17, oh, Pulling Profits Out of a Hat. So my question was, was uh, you know, have you got new, some new books out? Uh, 17 of them. So yeah, the, the, that's the last one. The one before that was called The Wealth Coach. I wrote that because um, kids just aren't learning money. And uh, I wanted to write a book where kids could learn the subject of money. And funnily enough, I wrote it with a specific friend of mine's kids in mind and uh, I gave him the book and said, what do you think? Will this work for you kids? He read the book and he says, no, it won't work for my kids. I need to read it first because I don't understand most of that stuff. I was like, yeah. So here's a, a book I thought I was writing for kids. It ended up being a book for adults and kids. So I went and rewrote it to make it a bit more adult uh, friendly. But he, as he said to me, he said, most of the stuff I've never learned about money. I, cause people don't study money. They, they, yeah. For some reason, people get embarrassed when you talk about, it's like that crazy thing of, you know, you don't talk about money at the dinner table. You should always talk about money at the dinner table. Cause if you don't, when are you going to learn it? How are you going to learn money? You know, money's yeah. a subject you got to learn. You got to understand if, if you understand money, you can be financially free in 10 years. If you don't understand money, you will work for money for the rest of your life and you'll never be financially free. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So with, with all that you've achieved now, Brad, what's your vision for the next 12 months, the next 10 years? What, what's on the cards for you? Yeah, the next, well, the next 12 months is uh, from a business standpoint, taking advantage of all the opportunities out there. There's going to be a lot of businesses we'll buy in the next 12 months yeah. um, and, and we'll build them up and sell them off because they'll be going very, very cheap in a lot of cases. Um, the next 20 years, you know, I, I'm, it's my 50th birthday next year and uh, come 50 was a time for me to start divesting. So I'll start selling off companies uh, at around 50 and start uh, being more of a relaxed person. Uh, I'm pretty relaxed nowadays. I mostly, most weeks, other than during COVID, I, I've worked two, two days a week for the last, got to be eight, nine years. Um, I work Tuesdays and Thursdays while the kids are at school and uh, other than and that I'm pretty relaxed and, and live a good life. And in, I spend a lot of time investing though. I do a lot of investing these days. Um, from a life point of view, look, we, my wife and I agreed that our first goal was to get all of our kids through college successfully, you know, get them through school and college successfully and set them up for a good life. So I think the baby is only two. So I've still got what 20 something years to go there. So uh, I, I got to stay fit and healthy to make sure I keep up with Riley and uh, the twins. So, uh, you know, most of, uh, if I go back to my philosophy, being in business should give you more life. Business shouldn't be your life. Business should provide you with a life. It's a vehicle to give you a great life. You know, I'm, I've been very lucky in my life in that I've, my business allows me to leave a legacy. My business allows me to help people massively. And so, if I get a lot of people that I can help grow businesses and become successful employers, then that I'll be pretty happy if that's, if that's the legacy I leave that, you know, there's millions of people who are in business because of me or, or succeeded in business because of me and my team. Beautiful. Love that. How can the, the, the listeners will be thinking, how can they get involved with you? How can they follow you? Uh, how's the best way for them to get in touch with you? You can find me on any social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, I'm not on Pinterest though. You, you won't find me on there. I'm not that crafty. <laughs> um, uh, you can also find me on YouTube or my website, bradsugars.com or jump on actioncoach.com. Go see one of my coaches, grab a coach, have them help you grow your business, help them. Uh, they, they, they're a great team of people. We, very lucky to have such great people and they'll, they'll be more than willing to help you grow your business. But Amazon has all the books, jump on there, um, start reading, start studying. That's, that's the key to it, I believe.
Yeah, and you're doing Facebook Lives like nearly every day. It keeps popping up on my thing, on my Facebook. Yeah, I do drive time pretty much every day. Every day when I go to the gym or I drop the kids off to school, I take five minutes. My team once said to me, they said, boss, we need more content. And I'm like, seriously, I don't have any time to do content. I'm not coming into the TV studio and doing all that because we have a TV studio at my office. And uh, they looked at me and said, well, when do you have spare time? I said, I don't know, when I'm in the car. And they're like, perfect. So they went and set this whole rig up so that when I get in my car, I just press a button and I'm, I'm live on Facebook and Instagram and teaching people all about business and success. So yeah, drive time's a lot of fun. I get to have a drive with a bunch of people every day and we talk about success. Beautiful, beautiful. So we've got you on tap. <laughs> you know, it, it seems that way. It's, it's, it's funny because a lot of people are like, you teach a lot of free stuff out there on, on Instagram and on the Facebook. And I'm like, yeah. Well, why do you give it away? Well, because people need it. And no one seems to understand that. I remember in Australia when I first started doing my free seminars way, way, way back when, and everyone was so like, stop doing free seminars. You know, it's like, no, you know what? People need this stuff. I'm going to teach it for free and see what happens. Yeah. Love that. Love it. All righty. Are, are you now ready for JJ's rapid fire questions? All right. It's the rapid fire time. <laughs> See if I can survive the gunshots. Let's go. All righty. So what's the best piece of advice you've been given? Never wish your life were easier. Wish that you were better. Jim Rohn. Love that. Your favorite book. That's going to be other, a hard one. Other than mine. Um, <laughs> My Life in Advertising and Scientific Advertising, two books written in the 1920s by Claude C. Hopkins. Oh, beautiful. Who would play you in a movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, ben Stiller. Ben That's Stiller. Her. Ben oh, Stiller. Ben Stiller. <laughs> he's, he's crazy enough and smart enough. There you go. <laughs> What's one thing on your bucket list? Oh, one thing that's currently, you, you know, you do know I'm partners with Travis Bell in a company called no, Bucketless Life Coaching. So no, yeah, I didn't. Travis Bell runs Bucketless Life Coaching. So we teach people how to build a bucketless life plan. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, one thing on my bucket list to go to space. That's one space. thing. Beautiful. If you could trade lives with anyone for one day, who would it be and why? One of my kids. My God, their life is so much easier than mine was. <laughs> I'd be one of my kids. <laughs> Three words that describe you. Um, fun. Focused. See, I, I keep going back to, you know, husband, father, and entrepreneur. So maybe, maybe those three are the one. Husband, father, entrepreneur. Yeah. If you could have any five people at a dinner whether they're dead now or alive, who would okay. they be? Um, Sir Richard yep. Branson, Rupert Murdoch, um, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, yeah, I'd have all business people, all business people, because I, I, I love talking business. I just love that. And I could talk with them all for hours and just pry into their minds for hours and hours on end. Love it. If you could have one superpower, what would you have? Invisible. Yeah. <laughs> what you got to remember, I have five kids. Those sorts of questions get asked all the time. <laughs> what TV sitcom family would you be a member of? Oh God, modern family. Modern family. Mm. And, and the last one is what legacy do you want to be remembered for? Uh, helping people become entrepreneurs and survive in business and thrive in business, yeah. Love it. Helping, helping people get into business and stay in business. Creating love. jobs. You know, that's a, I love business owners because they create more jobs. That's what they do and they never get any kudos for it. They're phenomenal for that stuff. Yeah, love yeah. it. Thank you so much, Brad. It's been such, I could, I could speak to you for hours. <laughs> I respect your time. And I, I really respect that you've uh, given an hour of your time to 
to really serve my community and uh, I really appreciate that. I love your work. I've already learned heaps from you. So I'm going to listen back to the podcast and get those tips. Brilliant. And uh, the, the books that you've uh, also said about. Yep. So, uh, JJ, I'll... can I say one thing? If anyone's, if anyone's watching this podcast or listening to this podcast for the first time, please subscribe. Don't just listen once. You got to keep coming back and keep coming back. JJ's doing a million, uh, brilliant job out there of educating. So, Stay with her. Keep learning from her. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for serving and all that you do and for all the ripple effect that you have out in the world. I think sometimes, you know, as coaches, one thing I, I often think about is sometimes you get feedback from people and that's beautiful, but there's also the people that you're helping yeah. out there that you'll never, ever know. You'll never, ever know that the grandma that you help to the the daughter, the son, the auntie. Uh, so, you know, I, I love coaches and, and uh, that's why I became a coach because it's about serving others. So I love your work, Brad. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate your time today. Welcome. Most welcome. Thank you so much.